Hi, this is Amy Lewis with Cisco Marketing. I'm here today with Josh Atwell. Hi. And Mike Laverick. Hello. And we're here with Engineers Unplugged. So, are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. Are you ready? We're ready. Are you ready? I'm not sure you are. Take it away. Thanks, Amy. So, Mike, we go back a good bit now, and um, we've been having a lot of conversations lately about what's a cloud architect? And, um, well, I'm going to let you kind of start off, because in your new role at VMware, this is kind of, you know, to the heart of a lot of the things that you're doing. So, you know, when someone says cloud architect, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Well, what comes to my mind is being an architect is being an architect. Whatever it is that you're architecting, it's the same principles about how you approach that. The fact that it, we call it cloud is probably neither here nor there. So if you've been a virtualization architect, I think you can be a cloud architect. It's just about understanding what you're trying to achieve and then filtering that through what your products are capable of. So, yeah, I, I don't wanna, I don't like the idea of it sort of having to become a, like a special role or we, we must advertise for our cloud architect uh, and fill this role. I think it's something that people who've been in virtualization for a while can relatively easy migrate into. Now, one thing that I've, I, I kind of see though, because I've been a virtualization engineer, done architecture work, the, the cloud component though is, the, there's new layers of abstraction and there's new tools required for automation and, and being able to provision things dynamically and provide that uh, environment for you know, people you know, like our viewers who are trying to move to cloud and make a more agile data center. You know, it, it does present some new challenges that the traditional virtualization architect may not see. So, um, I mean, what are the biggest challenges that you're seeing? Because I mean, I know what I see, but. I think probably the easiest way to sort of describe that is perhaps use the whiteboard a little bit. Oh yeah, well, and we, we got a whiteboard. We've got a whiteboard, we have to write on it. It's kind of like right. mandatory. But um, what I've been doing in my own lab environment is completely changing the way I've laid out my physical environment to suit what I'm trying to achieve with the cloud director. So previously, like when I was doing my SRM Here, stuff, I think. you take the mic so you can chat and draw. I can chat and draw and use the hand. Oh, multiple, multi dexterous. I used to have a, a bunch of VMs, say a bunch of web VMs, and they would all be all stored on a series of LUNs. And like you kind of silo down, mainly for my SRM work, so I could take all those LUNs and replicate them somewhere else. Now I could carry on doing that in my vCloud environment if I wanted to, but it's it's not really, I think, the way that we should be looking at the way the resources are compiled, because what you end up is with silos of applications. Right. Now, people love silos and you know really yeah, like we, silos. We've talked about that a lot. And the reason they like them is that they know uh, everything that is in there is contained, it can't be affected by other things, yada, yada, yada. So what I'm trying to get across to people when I'm, when I'm looking at this now is saying, you could still have your silo, but it needs to be kind of a soft silo that's created not by separation of physical resources, but separation of virtual resources. Right. So I'll give you an idea of what I've done with my kind of storage. Help me with the white, wiping of the board here. Oh, yeah, yeah. There you go. Say I need my lackey to wipe the board for me, you see. So what I've done is I actually have two arrays of two different types. I won't mention who they are, vendor A and vendor B. And I've got exactly the same type of storage array over here from the same vendor. This happens to be SAS. This happens to be SATA. This, I've only got like two terabytes on each array. This one, I've got something like six terabytes, eight terabytes on that. So typically when I get these arrays from the vendors, they, they give me two arrays so I could do replication at the same time, but they obviously don't give me two SAS arrays. They give me a lot of cheap storage. So um, how did I go about partitioning? Because previously I would have had a series of little LUNs representing all my applications, so I could replicate just one LUN or whatever. What I ended up doing is the vast majority of this storage was carved up into either a single LUN, mm -hmm. or in the case of another vendor, it was a series of LUNs, all of them about 
half a terabyte in size, and then made into a data Story store cluster. Yeah. Now, the reason that happened was this particular vendor, when you write to it, it writes across all the disks in the array. Right. This particular vendor looks at the uh, LUN and only writes it across some of the disks in the array. So theoretically, that could be a hot LUN and that could be a cold LUN. So I wanted to use VMware's uh, distributed uh, storage, you know, the, um, sorry, the SRDS and profiles. So um, all of that now gets replicated over here. And of course, that took a chunk of storage out of these arrays because I needed to reserve space for that replication. I called this my uh, tier one because it's uh, replicated every five minutes. It's fiber channel. I called this my tier two. It's uh, iSCSI-based storage, replicated only once an hour. The funny thing that I was left with, though, is what to do with the remaining of the space that's on two different uh, storage vendors. Because I, I, could, I couldn't use all of it by replicating it because this is smaller than this. Right. So what I ended up doing was a very similar thing. I partitioned this space up. It's on SATA. Mm -hmm. So I classed that as a lower tier of storage. Right. And then using VMware's uh, vSphere replication, I enabled replication between two different oh, storage right. vendors. So, me... so one thing I want to I point out that you, you really touched on it, and, and it goes to the heart of the cloud architect part, is that you, you, you no longer were carving up resources for use. You were actually tiering, creating a disaster recovery. I mean, you actually architected your storage in such a way that it met multiple demands in the environment, rather than just saying, I'm running on virtualization, I have to run SAN. And then as adoption increased with NFS, then you, know, you really are now better utilizing these resources and then adapting them so that you can meet multiple use cases within the same environment. Now the other thing I was going to say is, is that the way these resources are now consumed, I'm not thinking it from an individual application owner, I'm thinking about a cloud tenant. So if I've got, I don't know, two different tenants in two different virtual data centers, I can then uh, expose different tiers of storage to them, yeah? Right. Depending on what their needs are. Now the assumption I've had to make is, if, if this tier of storage all went down, everything would have to be flopped over here. Both tenants would be affected because they're sharing the same pool of storage. Previously when I was carving up my storage without thinking about the cloud director, I was thinking about the application owner and being able to fail over just the mail or just the uh, database systems. Now I'm thinking about an entire organization's failover. What I lost here is a little bit of granularity, because if I do a failover with SRM, everything in here gets moved. I can't say just this tenant's affected and not this one. So another thing I've been thinking about is using all this native replication from the storage vendor, maybe I'd be better off with VR, vSphere replication, because you can do it on a per virtual machine basis. That's much more granular. I think probably what will happen as the years roll by is that these vendors will become so VM aware that you can actually fail over an individual VM, not an entire LUN. So, <clears throat> kind of in closing on this though, what it really comes down to, I think the biggest difference between virtualization architect and cloud architect is having to think about this particular layer, mm. right? It's no longer consolidation of resources and, and trying to maximize availability. It's really about providing an entire service for, a, for an organization, one of your tenants, one of the, or, the groups that are actually now paying the bills because this is now something where it's a model that you can charge based on usage. Sure. And the other thing I've had to do is, um, in my books I had like a kind of analogy of a company. Yeah. To make this make sense, I've had to make this into a massive holding company which you then has business, change. which has businesses yeah. inside it. Yeah. So I've gone from a very macro level rather than just looking at, say, one of these tenants on their own. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's a totally additional way. I mean, you got to line you got to line up with the the business impact and the business decisions sure. that that you have. Which in your case is a lab. Which I I wish my lab was as nice <laughs> as your lab. And what a wonderful transition point. So thank you for that. I, I think that it would be awesome to have you guys back on Engineers Unplugged to kind of take us through that second tier of what is the business impact of this? This was, love this this stuff. Yeah, I mean, what I really need is Josh's help on my network, but it was just it was just too much of a mess to bring it up in a seven minute video. I see, so we'll, we'll do that again. So Mike's gonna do a console with Josh about his home network because that's what you, the viewers, care about. But before we get that, I think they should have to compete, which is 
it's unicorn time. Oh yeah, it's unicorn time. Start to draw you. Oh yeah, you can't, you can't get we Josh's. We don't have this in the UK. We don't have unicorns in the UK. Well, if you need Josh's time, you've got to draw a unicorn. Go. I have to draw a unicorn. Go. You want the head or the I want the head. All right, you can commentate while Josh draws. Okay, uh, I'm not really quite sure what we're doing here, but uh, apparently there's some sort of thing about unicorns in in our world, and uh, I know unicorns exist, but only when I've seen them on bits of paper. So do I have to draw the head of the unicorn? Yep. All right. Okay. <laughs> so those those are the ears, and that's his mouth, and that's his head. Nash horn, horn on the unicorn. How is that? You know, I have to give them uh, credit. That's unicorn to scale. Good job. You've scaled out that unicorn. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, the viewers at home, tell us what you think. Is this unicorn consult worthy? So, we'll see you on engineersunplugged.com. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you, Josh. Until next time. Mm -hmm.